discuss the assignment questions and uh, we try to map how to assess this particular paper. Yesterday, we dealt with two poems by Kamala Das, also known as Ami, um, Madhavi Kutti, Kamala Soraya, and so on. We tried to identify the recurring themes in her poems. We tried to identify her, how her biographical details uh, intertwined with what uh, came into her, her, her writing. And uh, we tried to see how her writings have, in a way, been quite popular and how the confessional tone in her, in her, in her poem uh, comes into our attention. So these are things that we've discussed so far. And uh, as we parted yesterday, I had shared a link with you uh, of a YouTube link of the adaptation of Salman Rushdie's novel, Midnight's Children. Before we begin, before we get started, let me briefly talk to you about a cautionate thing. A cautionate thing in the sense that uh, more often than not, as students of literature, you may come across adaptations of the works that you learn in the digital form. Most of the plays that you study, or the most of the novels that you study, have been ad adopted into the celluloid. So you may come across direct adaptations, or you know, there could be uh, certain uh, different uh, alterations being made to the real stories. But nonetheless, you have come across stories in digital form. So more often than not, I have come or I have noticed that uh, our learners tend to watch the movies probably because they are visual learners and not uh, that much of a read learner. And they find it a little bit difficult to read through all these textbooks. So maybe, especially when it comes to MEG3, I know quite a lot of learners who go to YouTube or other sources and try to download movies or movie adaptations of the works prescribed for study. There is nothing wrong in watching movies which have been prescribed for study. That may, one way or the other, help you to come out uh, with a better appreciation of the work that you are dealing with. But that being said, I must also caution you about that particular word, adaptation. A movie that is being made out of a novel is not basically the novel itself. There could be certain additions and deletions to suit the other medium. So more often than not, what you see in the movie may not be sometimes present in the uh, story or vice versa. What you have read may not come into the visual scenario. There are quite a lot of popular and unpopular examples. I'm not going to that for the time being. Maybe we'll discuss that at a later point of time in some other paper. But nonetheless, I just wanted to throw a word of caution. When you watch these movies, be aware that that alone is not the story especially while adapting a, mo a novel like Midnight's Children. Um, it, it, nobody can kind of recreate the uh, sort of, uh, what you call, mastery that that novel possesses. Especially uh, the sort of magic realism that Rushdie brings into that novel can never be equally retained uh, in a film adaptation. With all due respect to Deepa Mehta, that is. So uh, when you watch that movie, just watch it for the sake of uh, visual appreciation, but then go back to the book and read that. We'll come back to Rushdie sometime later this week. But then for the time being, whatever movies you watch, please be wary of this particular attribute of that uh, movie or that work or the text to film transformation thing. Okay, so as we get the day started with, Today, I thought of dealing with a particular novel and then maybe a few passive references of another novel to which I shall come back if time permits later. And then I thought if we get time, we'll go through a couple of poems as well. The reason why I'm focusing on poems is because you have annotations. Uh, the stories of novels or plays or short stories, you may still be able to read from the blocks and appear for the exam, but annotation is something that would require a little bit more of a deliberate effort. So that's why I'm trying to include poems in all the sessions as much as possible. Uh, we'll see, as time permits, we'll try to involve it. If it doesn't happen, the next. So uh, there are two ways in which I could have begun today's session. Because the novel that I deal with, or the novels that I plan to deal with today, can 
be discussed at least on two grounds and one of those common grounds is none other than Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Yes, there is a much more poignant, much more essential element that cries out for a larger discussion. I'll definitely come to that a little while later. But to get started with, my starting reference point is Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the leader who gained this independence, who struggles gained this independence. It is unprecedented before or after Mr. Gandhi that any country gained independence without an armed rebellion. You take the case of African independence. You take the case of any other Asian or, Af or American or Latin American countries uh, in their struggle for independence. They are all bloody revolutions. Take the case of French Revolution, for instance. So there was a great freedom fighter we were blessed to have amidst us who preached and practiced nonviolence and showed to the world how an eye for an eye can turn a whole world blind. Just like in Richard Attenborough's trailer that we saw in the beginning of the class, when Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi passed away, when Gandhi ji passed away, don't get me wrong that I'm not addressing Ms. Gandhi ji right from the beginning. It's just that teaching literature, I'm just putting it into perspective with all due respect to her. So, uh, yeah, so in that trial, there is this popular statement. So when Gandhi ji passed away, one of the most popular scientists of that time, the man behind, the brain behind the nuclear atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Sir Albert Einstein, he made this popular reference. He said, generations to come will scarcely believe such a man with flesh and blood walked upon this earth. It will be really difficult for generations to believe that man with a lati and a kadi cloth worn uh, with a minimalistic attire graced this particular earth and fought for freedom and eventually won it for the nation. This is not the month of January. This is not the month of October. Normally in India in recent times, those are the two times when we speak of Gandhi. During his Janmashtami or during his uh, Martyrdom Day. Otherwise, we seldom speak about uh, our you know, Bapu. There are some political controversies. That's the exception when Gandhiji surfaces again. We do watch him every time in the notes. So there are streets that we walk through, which are named after the Mahatma. But then seldom do we initiate discussions about Gandhiji before or after uh, his birth and death. Dates, that is. But here we have a couple of novels, a couple of works which deal with Gandhiji as a character or as a presence. And it becomes imminent to discuss him. And it's my pleasure to discuss Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi to you. To discuss him in a world where, from a country in which he gained independence through a lifelong struggle. Belonging to a country where he dreamed for democracy. To a country where he abandoned the opportunity to rule the country. Having fought for freedom and having gained independence, he could have easily be, uh, got thrown into the uh, prime ministership of India. Or he could have been in any other positions or capacities for that sake. But he was so selfless and devoted to the cause of nation that he despised or he, he dis, uh, disagreed with any such offers. He dismissed all those offers and he continued his service in a partition driven nation divided by the partition okay so when we speak about Gandhiji there are quite a lot of works that would come to our mind especially when we speak about movie adaptations yes it took a foreigner to make a biopic on Gandhi it required Richard Attenborough to come and say okay watch this movie on Gandhi or we come across a lot of adaptations including the Legere Homunabai series or off late, there was a movie titled Gandhi versus Godse, The War. So there are plenty of movies made on Gandhi. 
there are plenty of works written on Gandhi. When I say works, biographical sketches, experiences, accounts, conversations. There is currently a book that has been published by the Gandhi Smriti Darshan Samiti, New Delhi, which comes under the Cultural Affairs Ministry of India. They have published a book called uh, Conversations with Bapu. Uh, it, they are Im imaginary conversations by the president of Gandhi Smriti Darshan Samiti, uh, Mr. Dr. Vedabhya Skundu and uh, Mohandas Gandhi. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a compelling read. I'll share the link a little while later. But then there are plenty of works on Gandhi. There are plenty of movies on Gandhi. There are plenty of adaptations on Gandhi. Uh, off late over the last seven to eight years, there are quite a lot of anti-Gandhi works as well. We I don't want to get political, but then there are plenty of uh, people who would speak against Gandhi. There are people who would glorify his murderer and uh, a lot of other things being written and said. I'm not getting into those things for the time being because this is an academic platform. Streamed live, that is. So for the time being, I'll stick to the task at hand. If you have gone through the blocks, having written the assignments, you may be familiar with, or you may have already guessed the novels that I'm putting into perspective for the time being. You would be aware that I'm talking precisely about Mulkraj Anand's Untouchable and partially Raja Rao's Kantapura. So that calls for a basic overview of these writers. Yesterday, quite coincidentally, during the Q&A session, I had a question from MAG3, Tom Johns. And uh, I was so happy that uh, I was able to discuss Tom Johns and MAG3 for a brief while yesterday. Today's session can also be begun by a reference from MAG3. While discussing the rise of the novel, the rise of modern novel in England, there is this popular essay by Ian Watt with the same title, The Rise of the Dover. If you haven't read it, you must read it because mostly in MEG3, question number one is trace the evolution of novel and its, its salient features. So there are certain reasons that necessitated the rise of modern novel in Britain, including industrialization. There are literary features like realism that came forth into novel writing. And there were people who heralded this or pioneered this novel writing process in order to popularize that in Britain. So there is this popular saying that there's a statement called the three wheels of modern novel. The three wheels, chakrangal, right? The three wheels of modern novel, W-H-E-E-L-S. The three wheels of modern novel. Who are they? The three wheels of modern novel. If you have gone through the blocks of MEG3, can somebody enlighten us about the three wheels of modern novel? You know at least one. That's why I'm asking you. The three wheels of modern novel. Okay, doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe due to the shuffled scenario, you may have it in the second year, maybe. That doesn't matter. Okay. So, uh, the three wheels of modern novel includes Samuel Richardson, Henry Fielding, and Tobias Smollett. You don't have Smollett. You have references to Richardson in block one and two. And uh, Tom Jones, you already have of Henry Fielding. So these three people designed the ways in which the modern English novel was to function in Britain, way back in 1740 to 1760, perhaps. Generally, when we learn literature, literature is combined, or in, the study of literature is combined with the study of historical events during that time. The moment we say William Shakespeare's drama, we also invoke another term, Elizabethan theater, by alluding to the then queen, Queen Elizabeth. Or when we speak about Matthew Arnold, Sir Matthew Arnold and his poems, we speak about Victorian era, referring to Queen Victoria. Similarly, or knowingly or unknowingly, more often when it comes to the study of Indian English literature, the learners don't give history that much of an importance. They simply look at the story, even in a poem or a play or a novel. They look at the summary, they look at the storyline and they try to fit it. Or sometimes they look at the biographical details of the author and they try to fit it. But more often than not, 
in indian english literature also history has a significance while you try to interpret certain texts i'm not saying every text yesterday when we discussed kamala das her biographical details were very integral to the appreciation of the two poems that we learned yesterday similarly when we try to interpret certain novels here or there uh we have to be aware of the fact that there is this uh, historical allusions that would come or that would surface so just to get started with just like we call richardson fielding and smollett the three wheels of modern english novel in india also we had three wheels of indian english novel who designed the shape of shape and functions in which the indian english novel was to travel for a few decades right from 1930 1940 onwards up until 1960s there were three stalwarts who wrote enriched and popularized indian writing in english you know their names by now mulk raj anand raja rao yes there is one guy i've kept to the last though i should be mentioning him in the beginning you study him in the short story section though he is also a prominent novelist who has written novels like swami and his friends the dark room the english teacher and so on and so forth uh i just get reminded of this title the english teacher because as an undergraduate learner i got hold of that novel by reading the blurb assuming that it's a romance story between an english teacher and his wife but quite contrastingly it is a dystopian fiction a dystopian fiction where a couple get married and uh, they go to feast among their relatives so in one such visit the wife had the nature's call so she had to pass the two bathroom so she asked for the toilet and they showed a toilet outside the house so she went to the toilet and it was quite dirty and while she was doing uh, the thing a flea sat on it and came and sat on her mouth uh, sorry on her nose and right from that day she got terribly disturbed she got a fever and she passed away and her poor newly wed husband kept that was desolate and kept following her and even got an opportunity to talk to her atma through conjuring from a person and conversed with her and that's quite an interesting tale though though not a pleasant tale so rk narayan is the third in that wheel rk narayan mulk raj anand and raja rao are the three founders of modern indian novel who designed the way in which the indian english novel was to transform from their after as i have already mentioned several times before this week indian english had been considered to be something derogatory up until then an exception was with rabindranath tagore who was knighted in 1910 13 just to be dismissed he he was given the sir status and he dismissed that offer so take tagore out there were not no prominent writers including sarojini naidu or toru dat or bankim chandra chatterjee who was given their due acceptance as indian english writers from rk narayan onwards prose writing in india gained momentum or gathered momentum just in case you are taking notes these are certain statements that you may take down the three wheels of indian novel rk narayan mulk raj anand and raja rao and the moment they started writing post 1930s prose writing in india gathered momentum it gathered momentum in such a way that the writings in english was radically transformed i'll come to the writing styles later when i teach rashtri because there is a reference in that blocks on midnight children on how english language is monotonous and how these three writers and also people like rashdi brought in an indianness a dialogism a musicality to english how did they achieve that effect they achieved that effect by bringing in colloquialisms 
by using Indian words, blending languages. For instance, words like Are, I just told you no. Are, I just told you no, fluctuating with the grammar. Right? I just told you, man, is something that's grammatical. But Are, I told you no, is a deliberate thwarting of the grammaticality. And look at the Indian word coming in. Are, Yasundre, Deko. So there are words like that being deliberately juxtaposed into an English work of fiction by these writers in order to attain a heightened effect. Along with that, they also bring in a lot of other techniques borrowed from the British or that are indigenous in order to attain these effects. So talking about these three people, they popularized an Indian English writing tradition. Maybe you are slightly confused that I'm not talking about the text right now, but talking about these writers because this is very, this is equally important. This background is equally significant. And when I speak about 1930s to 1950s, the peak when these people wrote, what was going on in India? What is special historically between 1930s to 1950s? Or let's say 60s? What was going on? Yes, Amiradji. The freedom struggle was going on. Yeah, precisely. The freedom struggle, the, the Indian independence movement was gathering momentum from 1930s to 1950 or 47 when we gained independence. That is. So during that period, literature played a pivotal role in helping the Indian freedom struggle gain momentum. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's verses. Rabindranath Tagore's was as poetry in particular was highly influential in popularizing the freedom movement. Novels written by these three people, especially Mulkrajanand and Raja Rao, mirrored the then Indian political conditions. In a way, they served as propaganda literature. They fueled the movement. They tried to register to chronicle and to foster the Indian independence movement by all the freedom fighters. Among the several freedom fighters, Mohandas Karamchen Gan and of course Jawaharlal Nehru came as characters in their novels, which is to be mentioned at this point of time. Along with that, the period between 1930 to 1950 also witnessed a radical shift in a lot of Indian thoughts, or thought processes. As rightly marked by Mulkrajanand in Untouchable, one thing that Indian independence movement did to Indian people is that it united them by thwarting all the caste inequalities that existed until then, or the religious equations that, are, that existed until then. Maybe partition slightly uh, undid that entire process, but up until then, we could see that there was a gathering when these leaders gave a speech, when Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Rajguru, Neraji Subhashandra Bose, or Jawaharlal Nehru, or uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, or Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi gave a speech, there were large gatherings, especially from far across villages. People gathered to listen to these heroes. They became part of this independence movement. They got beaten by the British cops and a mass movement ensued. A lot of people uh, went to jail voluntarily, popularly noted in the history, in the annals of history as Jail Borough Andolan. So during the Jail Borough Andolan, uh, there was this deliberate jail bharti that was being happened. So these public meetings and jails are places where you can't really exercise your privilege and uh, false notions and superstitions. 
you cannot say i belong to this particular caste and i can't sit with this particular caste guy so these are certain social occasions or gatherings or places which thwarted the caste dynamics in india to a certain extent and leaders like gandhiji were very much particular in enlightening the masses to do away with all the personal evils including consumption of alcohol caste hierarchy or discrimination and so on and so forth and uh, they were able to instill a sense of national uh, or patriotic feelings and uh, a need to be together be united so all this formed the fray of the writings of these uh, prose writers from 1930s to 1950 so that period also witnessed a transformation in the way indians looked at caste and religion so something that is notable to us at this particular point is the caste system so what exactly is the caste system in india can somebody tell me how the four tier caste hierarchy was established in india this is not a monotonous lecture feel free to unmute yourself and speak up the four tier caste system in india it's a simple question anybody so it was based on the occupation of the person precisely yes can you name the four the four castes the kshatriyas the brahmanas uh, the vaishyas Vesh, um, and the shudras yeah precisely so the chaturvarnya system functions under this four partitioned system where you have brahmans on the upper part of that caste chaturvarnya system then you have kshatriyas shudras sorry vaishyas and uh, in the lower part of the pyramid you have shudras out of that we have people who belong out of this entire classification system who may be called as the outcasts or dalits again just a couple of minutes of digression just to give you an extended thought process when you study mg5 literary theory and criticism when you come across jack derrida and his theory of deconstruction he precisely speaks about uh, a scenario where uh, center is, a, is an all encompassed body of power and uh, there is a movement or a flux from the corners to the center and vice versa in this power struggle and he speaks about how people get thrown out of the periphery amidst the struggle and how the center in itself is an imaginary construct but despite that gains power uh, in its imaginary hypothetical position this was applied to the indian context by his translator uh, gayatri chakravarti spivak who translated his works like of grammatology for instance so she wrote a work called can the subaltern speak can the subaltern speak and uh, i think somebody's mic is unmute anurag singh okay it's mute so can the subaltern speak is a work written by gayatri chakravarti spivak where she applies jack derrida's concepts of deconstruction into indian political scenario indian caste political di dimension and she tries to speak about how the dalits become marginalized do not get into even the corners of that cycle and how they are thrown out of that cycle and how there is a power tussle going on so there are plenty of such examples that i can talk about but for the time being let me stick to uh, mulkraj anand's untouchable so the caste system in india was pretty much deeply rooted and needless to say condemnable from a progressive outlook when we speak about democracy when we speak about equalitarian uh, and equalitarian dynamics uh, differentiations of any kind whether on the basis of caste color creed religion or whatever is to be condemned 
So from that particular point, uh, context, India practiced Chaturvarnya system among several other social levels like Sati. Raja Ram Mohan Roy was instrumental in abandoning or in abolishing the evil practice of Sati against a lot of opposition. Similarly, the, the freedom struggle gave a momentum to uh, abandon this Chaturvarnya system or the discrimination meted out to the poor. The rise of Dr. Dhiru, uh, Dr. Ambedkar uh, also led to um, representation of minorities as he became the chairman of the Constitution Drafting Committee. Uh, it, he was able to implement certain measures in the Constitution which would ensure that no discrimination of any sort is meted out to anybody, including the caste reservation system. There could be disputes, there could be discussions, but then my focus here is untouchability as a social menace. So when it comes to Mulkraj Anand, Mulkraj Anand comes up with, I'm not going to discuss about other novels of his because of the lack of time. I'm just sticking to untouchable. In Untouchable, as the title suggests, the story is about a sweeper boy. <clears throat> a sweeper boy who is the son of a sweeper who belongs to this lower caste in the Chadurvarnya system, who gets abused by upper caste people. Back then, the so-called fourth strata of the caste people had to announce their arrival and the people in the higher tier would stay away from these people. Or when a higher caste person is walking in, then these people have to make way. There was such a social scenario that existed in India. So in that pretext, Mulkraj Anand places a protagonist and gives a narration on how untouchability is to be condemned. Needless to say, a parallel to untouchability can be seen in the Western world. That is called apartheid or racism, which was again fought by another mass leader, Martin Luther King. When it comes to India and other subcontinents, this caste system and untouchability became a, a larger menace. So we have a story or a, rather a novel by Mulkraj Anand on untouchability. As Mulkraj Anand was part of the freedom struggle and a great disciple or admirer of Mahatma Gandhi, the story has its origins from Gandhiji himself. Gandhiji once narrated the story of Uka, a sweeper boy, and his miseries during one of his speeches. This inspired Mulkraj Anand to attempt a novel depicting the plight of the Parayas. He consulted with Gandhiji at every stage of the novel writing and he took the suggestions by Gandhiji very seriously and eventually published the novel in 1931 if I remember correctly. Forgive me if the date is wrong. So in 1931 he published this novel finally. Uh, initially it had 250 pages approximately with a lot of monologues, large monologues and scholarly conversations and so on and so forth. But Gandhiji suggested that it was not befitting to the mouth of a person like the protagonist in that novel. So following his valid suggestion, Mulkraj Anand omitted all those large chunks of pieces and chiseled it down to say a hundred pages. Just in case you find it boring to read most of the works prescribed, Untouchable is a novel that you should and you must read because it's only a hundred page long. It's a delightful read. It's actually a touching read. I, I don't know if I should be using the word delightful, but it's a heart touching narrative rendered by uh, this uh, Mulkraj Anand. All right. So Mulkraj Anand in his works descri uh, describes this also because of his social commitment. And like many other writers, contemporary writers, for instance, R.K. Narayan did have social, social responsibility and bring in certain elements here and there. But he mainly focused on humor, including Swami and his friends. He, he focused on 
uh, half light-hearted writings which would enthrall the learn uh, the readers rather than get into a political discussion but mulk raja anand and to a certain extent raja rao found it essential to use their literature as an enlightening tool and to a certain extent they succeeded in that as well so to get started with oh yeah just a couple of further information more before we get started with um if you have written the assignment and if you have gone through the blocks of untouchable would someone mind sharing to me who wrote the preface of untouchable somebody said you don't have mg3 but then for those who have mg3 and those who have gone through that a novelist who is prescribed in mg3 a popular writer an anglo indian or an indo anglian writer i'm sorry he wrote the preface to uh, untouchable untouchable sorry who is it can you name the person most of our learn yes go on please is it em foster yes yes may i know your name please because i think you have entered from your husband's id perhaps may no it's name? my no it's my brother's id i am bhavna bhavna okay okay great sorry bhavna ji okay thank you so um, yeah cm foster more often than not our learners end up writing him as em forester they make him a jungle wala right so he doesn't have an e there he is em forester f o r s t e r so em forester who is known for his work a passage to india in mg3 uh, wrote the preface to untouchable and uh, let me now share my screen with you to share a study material on untouchable just to read a paragraph this is unit 3 and we have the introductory uh, the preface part from uh em foster to which i won't spend my time but then i would like to dedicate my time to this opening lines of untouchable would someone mind reading this like we did yesterday anyone guys anybody surinder ji have you put your hands up okay bhavna ji if you want to read you may read it's totally fine <coughs> sir i cannot see the screen properly okay let me see if i can enlarge it a little bit more is it visible now it's a very small paragraph yes the outcast colony was a group of mud walled houses that clustered together in two rows under the shadow both of the town and the cantonment but outside their boundaries and separate from them there lived the scavengers the leather workers the washerman the barbers the water carriers the grass cutters and other outcast from hindu society reference to this text are from the orient yeah, paper that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Thank, you. thank you so much so this is the opening part of the novel which describes how or the dwelling of the outcasts the uh, you know the the, the 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 what do you call the dystopian description of the outcast colony a group of mud walled houses clustered together in two rows um and uh, uh how these outcasts lived there whenever i read this opening lines while discussing this text with my learners i get reminded of another dalit anthology textbook the short story is titled jutan by om prakash valmiki i'm not sure how many of you have read om prakash valmiki and his jutan but i would like to share the opening paragraph of that work with you again coincidentally it is a tale of a sweeper's son a chuhare wale ka bacche ka kahani 
So Jyotan begins thus. Our house was adjacent to Chandarban Taga's cowshed. Next to it lived the families of Muslim weavers. Right in front of Chandraban Taga's cowshed was a little johri, a pond, which had created a sort of partition between Chuhra's dwellings and village. So the name of the johri was Dabowali. It is hard to say how it got the name Dabowali. Perhaps because its shape was that of a big pit. On one side of the pit were the high walls of the brick homes of the Tagas. At a right angle to these were the clay walls of the two or three homes of the Jinwas. After these, there were more homes of the Tagas. On the edges of the pond were the homes of Chuharas. All the women of the village, young girls, older women, even newly married brides would sit in the open space behind these homes at the edges of the pond to defecate, to defecate. Not just under the car of darkness, but even in daylight. The parda observing tagi women, their faces covered with saris, shawls around their shoulders, found relief in this open air latrine. They sat on Dabawali shows without worrying about decency. All the quarrels of the village would be discussed in the shape of a round table conference at the same spot. There was muck strewn everywhere. The stench was so overpowering that one would choke within a minute. The pigs wandering in narrow lanes, naked children, dogs, daily fights. This was the environment of my childhood. If the people who call the caste system an ideal social arrangement had to live in this arrangement for a day or two, they would change their mind. This is just the opening lines of Jutan by Om Prakash Valmiki. The story, just to get to you familiar with, just in case you haven't read it, in brief, is the story of the son of a sweeper. Post-independence, when laws have been passed where everybody can sit together in a roof, there is this one particular space, apart from gatherings and cinema halls, which revolutionizes and distorts these caste religion dynamics. There is none other than the classroom. The son of a Brahman, Kshatri, Vaishya, Shudra, or the outcast, or whatever, everybody comes together under a roof and they share meals and they discuss everything and they get together and they play together and they grow together in institutions that are called educational institutions. That's the sort of revolution that has been in India, thanks to British Navy. So, uh, Jutan happens at a time when these things have been enabled. So, the son of a sweeper, a person who used to be a sweeper in that school, gets enrolled to the first standard or second standard in a school. But then the teacher who belongs to the upper caste doesn't let this guy sit in the class. He either makes the student stand out or kneel down or thrashes him for no reason. And at a climactic point, he doesn't let the student enter the class, mind you, a first standard, second standard student, by handing him over a broom and asking him to clean the, college, the school premises. The principal goes another step forward by asking him to clean the entire campus by abusing him. Abe Chuhereke, you nasty uh, sweeper boy. So what happens after that when his father sees this is the climax of that story. And the shame that this two second standard student goes in front of his classmates and other fellows is also something that is to be noted while you read Jutan. It's just a cross reference, nothing uh, directly related to our story. Another book that I would recommend you to read is Poisoned Bread, an anthology edited by Arjun Dangle. It includes the titular short story by uh, Mahadev, I forgot his full name, Mahadev167, uh, just give me a second. Yeah, Bandhu Mahadev, Bandhu Mahadev. The poison bread where um, these parayas who work in the farm of the landlord, uh, they are humiliated by the landlord and they have to, they are, they are given instead of payment, 
they are given crumbs of bread with cow urine in the back shed. Not fresh bread, but breads which are given to the cows, which the cows ignore and pee on. Uh, these parayas are forced to eat that bread. And uh, there's a grandfather character in that story. He dies due to this, food poisoning. This, this includes a lot of poems and short stories and in thought provoking essays, this entire, this entire anthology. But what would be of interest to you is the introduction, which is spread across 40 pages. It deeply goes through the Dalit movement in India, the Black Panther movement, the Maratwada movement, uh, the, the internal conflicts and the, the problems of the Dalit women, how Marxism came into use and so on and so forth. So this is a highly informative, book that I would recommend you to go to. Now, let me just step out of the textbook, or rather the novel titled Untouchable. And uh, let me just, okay, uh, I don't want to waste time. So let me just mention that. Uh, I had shared with you the syllabus, question paper, and assignment links in the first class. This is nothing against the university. It's nothing against the Indira Gandhi National Open University. But somehow, again, I'd like to familiarize you with a technical term, a terminology that comes under the discussion of uh, caste oppression, which is significant to the modern times. That's called symbolic violence. Symbolic violence, even though the word has violence in it, doesn't have a downright violence with it. Symbolic violence is not thrashing up somebody or abusing somebody or anything. Symbolic violence is simply a power politics where a person belonging to an upper caste would behave discriminately to a lower caste person by simply ignoring him or her and not providing him spaces which could have easily been inclusive. Let's say, for instance, if I am taking I because it could be an easier example just to say it so that nobody gets offended. Let's say if I am in a capacitary position in an institution and I, if I belong to a so-called top three castes, I get into the stage as a teacher to address you. And there is a colleague of mine who belongs to caste four or five. And I simply don't invite him or her to the stage. That is an act of symbolic violence. Or when you team up with your colleagues or friends to not involve the other person and term yourself to be a particular group, maybe eating vegetarian and the other person is non-vegetarian and you do not involve that person in your group. That is an act of symbolic violence. Symbolic violence happens in various ways. And one reason why I, I, I'd like to spend some time on this is also because IGNU, the MEG course in IGNU, MA English course in IGNU, has 17 papers, irrespective of whatever changes have come to you this year. There is a paper called MEG 13. You take the prospectus, scroll, scroll through the paper list. You go to the web, download the PDF, scroll through the PDF. After paper 12, what comes is paper 14. Then paper 15, 16, 17, and then somewhere it is like, oh, yo, I forgot to add this paper. And then like an addendum comes paper 13. You go to previous year question papers. Every other papers have a name in assignments and previous year question papers, but when you click, it's like MEG 13. There is no sequence that is being followed. If you try to apply for the course in IGNU, again, it is not in the order. And if you, if you talk to anybody and ask them what are the papers before this cluster formation, that is MEG uh, 7, 10, and 14, and blah, blah, blah. I don't know whether MEG 13 belongs to any cluster. Forgive me if I'm wrong. But before this cluster formation, MEG 13 was the least opted subject. The paper is nothing but titled as Dalit literature or writings from the margins. See how symbolic violence operates in a national university. Well, I'm not saying that the director of IGNU or somebody from the central university head or from Delhi is doing this. No. 
It might just be a mischief from the clerk or it might be something from the DTP person. But whatever it is, when I, as a teacher of literature, as somebody who takes immense pride in discussing such progressive things, the moment I look at my own syllabus that I teach, I feel startled, stunned, shocked. Rather not shocked because this is a day-to-day -day affair that we come across, but then an act of symbolic violence where a paper on writings from the margins, Dalit literature, is played with or toyed with by the academia. And sometimes the students do not get to learn a wonderful play paper like that. Okay, so let's come back to the theme of untouchability. So the novel untouchable does not need an explanation because it deals with the theme of untouchability. Needless to say, it is a social evil. It was a social evil. Still, in some remote quarters, this exists. Despite the loss, this exists. And Raja, uh, sorry, Mulkaraj Anand wanted the scenario to change. And uh, what fueled him to dream of such a change was his master, that is Gandhiji, and his speeches or vision. So in the novel Untouchable, he tries to bring in the story of an outcast. His name is Baka. And maybe to attain a musical effect, maybe to attain an Indianized effect, he brings in this effect throughout the novel. Because Baka is the son of Laka, L-A-K-H-A. Laka is a sweeper and Baka is sweeper's son. And then he has a sister. And he has a younger brother. And his younger brother's name is Raka or Raka, whichever way you want to call it. R-A-K-H-A. -A. So Laka, Baka and Raka. The sister's name is different. Her name is Sohini, S-O-H-I-N-I. The novel is quite befitting to explain the Aristotelian theory of time, place and action in drama. It happens within a single day. There is unity of time. Within 24 hours, the novel unfolds. It, it traces a day in the life of Baka. So Baka, as I've already told you, is a son of a sweeper. He briefly worked in the British cantonment. And she looked the British cantonment with admiration because the Britishers did not discriminate between people in terms of caste. They had a sort of a style, a dignity, a way of living. Uh, Uka Nasiba is the person whose story Gandhiji narrates. I'll come to that a little while later. I had earlier mentioned it. Gandhiji in one of his speeches uh, refers to Uka's story. Uka was a sweeper boy. And Mulkraj Anand has adapted the story of Uka into this novel called Untouchable. Baka is, in a way, Uka put into literature. But then within this novel, there is a reference to Gandhiji's speech and to Uka. I'll come to that a little while later. Very good observation. I could see that you have read it thoroughly. Very good. Let's continue with the narration. So, a day of Baka's life. So, Baka was in British cantonment and he looked at it with admiration because they didn't discriminate between people, at least when he looks at it. So he tried to copy their manners in terms of dress code and other things. He used to get ridiculed by his people. And the moment he steps into his locale, he had to do this manual scavenging job. He had to clean the latrines. Even in the cantonment, he used to do that. But then in his city, I mean in his village, town, he has to do the scavenging work. His father also used to do the same. His father was a silly, senseless, abusive person. Baka, unlike his father, was a dreamer, was an idealist. He wanted to live in a fruitful, healthy manner. So we could see instances of that throughout the novel. We could also see situations where, due to the caste, these people are abused and discriminated. They are being swayed at. So when these people go, they have to yell out, saying, oh, oh, I am coming, and people would make way. Because one touch of this particular people, belonging to this caste, would pollute the upper caste people. That was the concept. 
uh, you may remember the instance with Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar went abroad, received quality education. He became a barrister. He came back to India. He went and became a teacher initially. He taught in a school. You may have heard the story, but I'm just telling it for the sake of it. Uh, in that school, staff room, all the teachers belong to the dominant caste. And in that staff room, there was this earthen pot, the mankalam, as we say in Malayana. And there was water, drinking water in that earthen pot, which these teachers used to drink. And when Dr. Ambedkar joined the department, Mind you, he was a barrister. He is an educated man. He later went on to become the uh, principal constitutors of our constitution. But then he was denied access to drink water from that urn. So we can imagine what Baka would have gone through. So Baka constantly went through these sort of discrimination. As a scavenger, he was abused by all those people. But then they were people who were good to him. The novel is also about this contrast. Indians, especially Indian Hindus, Indian upper caste Hindus who behave in a humiliating manner to Baka. Then six Mohammedans, Christians and so on and the Britishers that is who are comparatively kind to Baka. So there is this scenario where his father out of laziness or out of sickness asks Baka to go and take care of his work that particular day. That's where the novel begins. And as, a, as Baka embarks on that journey, he gets into a sort of a desire and he buys jalebis and he's about to eat them. He unknowingly touches a person. Later, it is revealed that he belongs to the dominant caste and that person starts abusing Baka. Immediate response of Baga to this abuse is he folds his hands in subservience and he says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, mujhe maaf kar do. I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to touch you, unknowingly I touched you. Upon the subservience, the response of the perpetrator didn't subside, but it only grew. He went on to cuss and abuse Baka. Then there was a crowd that assembled in that place and that crowd also maintained an arm's distance from Baka because he was untouchable. They started swearing at him. Baka wanted to run away but if he runs and touches any of that crowd it again becomes double the crime. And someone from the crowd started accusing that Baka slapped someone in the group which Baka didn't do and he tried to convince that but in vain. And amidst this chaos, Baka shouted that I'm a pariah and I'm coming through this, I want to go and he just walked through that mob. After that, Baka felt self-contemptuous. He was reflective and he wondered why he was submissive to that particular person. He could have put his hand up and simply said sorry. Or he could have spoken back or slapped them back. But the socio-political dynamics and conditions in India back then would not have favored Baka if he had retorted to violence. It didn't give him a dignified way of responding to that occasion. So Baka feels quite skeptical and quite contemptuous of himself as the novel progresses. He also lost his jalebi. So he was even thinking about I should have had my jalebi first. At least I would not have lost that. There are several times this word untouchable is used in that novel. Untouchable, untouchable, that's the word untouchable, I am an untouchable. Wales Baka at a particular point of time, page 56, 57 in the novel. See, that's how you read a novel. I told you yesterday. You, you give words the voice, right? It's simply written with exclamations. Untouchable, untouchable, that's the word untouchable. I am an untouchable. But you feel that feelings based on the context. Right? Even though the first one is an exclamation mark, it, it, it is actually a puzzled exclamation. Untouchable, untouchable, that's the word untouchable. I am an untouchable. That's how you read it. Right? 
I am untouchable in this context. I, I cannot be touched. And these people get polluted by my touch. He's frustrated. But then there are people who are benevolent to him. For instance, like Havildar Charat Singh in the cantonment, who gifts him a hockey stick for being so hardworking. He's very kind to him. Baka goes and plays hockey with his friends. And there is this lady who has married the foreigner, the Britisher. Uh, he carries her kid who got injured while playing hockey home, who was bleeding. And this lady, instead of thanking him, abuses him for polluting their environment. He sleeps. He falls half asleep amidst all this tiredness. And as he wakes up, yeah, he, then he, oh, okay, in, in between, it also happens that he happens to watch through a temple the site of a celebration and he joins hands because they, were, they didn't have the temple entry uh, privilege. Then all of a sudden there was a yelling call, it is polluted, it is polluted and he thought he got caught. He climbed down and he discovered that it was not him, but his sister was inside. It's not that she had polluted it, she being a sweeper, she was molested or attempted molesting by the priest of the temple. But when she resisted, and it came to a situation where the priest would be ex uh, exploit, uh, would be exposed. The priest yelled that this pariah lady has polluted a temple. Again, the entire masses rallied against the priest, against the sister, and not the priest. No deliberations would save uh, him or her sister. So he took her home. And while he took her home, his father was contemptuous of him because. Evenings, they go to the mohallas begging for food, saying, a paraya is here, give us something to eat. And he could only take, uh, he could not take much, so he, he, he called them a good-for-nothing fellow. Then he went back to the streets and begged for food, and nobody gave anything, and he dozed off. He woke up to the cussings of the lady at the home, because there was a sadhu, a sannyasi who was begging for food. She came out to give him the food, and he saw this guy. Uh, fallen asleep in the veranda. So she abused him, saying, you have polluted our place. So he undergoes an identity crisis. He's unable to fix his space. He desires to be in an equalitarian, egalitarian environment, but then he doesn't get an opportunity to be there. The Indian scenario keeps pulling him down. So when the novel arrives its climactic part, more often than not, what happens is most of the novels on untouchability or caste reservation and so on, they simply depict a particular scenario. But untouchable by um, Mulkraj Anand does not simply end by narrating Baka's story. Because there is really no story in that, just a few narrations, a few incidents. But the novel comes to a closure with a scenario where three solutions are offered to end untouchability, the malpractice of untouchability. As Baka walks out of the home, abandoned by his father, he is confused as to where to go next or whom to follow next. Then he comes ac across this Britisher, a colonel who yeah who urges his name is Hutchinson so Colonel Hutchinson who urges Baka to get converted into Christianity he says that Christ was a man who did not discriminate between anybody and he asks him to get converted into uh, Christianity but the concepts of man being a sinner by birth the original sin and other related stories is something that he is unable to relate then he sees a lot of crowd going towards a particular direction. He walks in that direction and he sees that Gandhiji is delivering a speech. He sees the magic of Gandhi. How his words of wisdom unites the nation where Parayas and Mohammedans and Hindus and uh, Muslims all together unite and discuss the cause of Indian independence. A parallel is slightly drawn there by Mulkrajanan between Christ and 
uh, Gandhi. It's a very skillful weaving, weaving, if I could tell you. He draws this parallels between Gandhi and Christ. And being an Indian, he's unable to relate to Christ, but then he instantly connects with Gandhi. And there, Nasiba, Gandhiji speaks about Uka, an untouchable, for whose sake he has always pleaded with his mother in his childhood, because he was a um, sweeper boy, a manual scavenger. So Gandhiji, in that speech, exhorts to uh, stay united, to not have this caste discriminatory practice. He asks the uh, untouchables to give up their evil habits of drinking alcohol and eating meat. He also asks them not to accept the remains of the food from the higher caste, but to insist on payment of food grains. That's why I quoted poisoned bread. In that story by Bandhu Madhav, a grandfather and a grandson goes and works in the Jamindar's Jameen. And uh, when they ask for the payment, he abuses them and he throws some crumbs of bread in the cattle farm. The cattle urinates in it. Even the cattle doesn't eat the bread. And because they are starving and they are poor, they have to resort to those breadcrumbs and the grandfather dies out of it. So Gandhiji urges the Indian pariahs to not accept such stale food, but resort to food grains, which are first hand. He also asks them to be cautionate about their drinking habits, to abandon, to not have alcohol, uh, what consumption whatsoever again for the malayalis out there we can see similar uh, similarities with uh, sri narayana guru here sri narayana guru was another reformatory leader who tried to unite people uh, across the caste barriers he fought for their causes and he uh, urged to not drink liquor so there are similarities that can be drawn between these people. And just as a, just as a light-hearted contrast, uh, Jesus Christ was someone who converted water into liquor. No, this is just a, this is just, this is just a joke. No uh, blasphemic in, uh, references. Christians may not get offended. I was just making a situational joke. Nothing apart from that. Okay. So the plot of Untouchable. Okay, there's a third, okay, there's a third solution. So apart from the missionary, apart from Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi's views on caste system, there was a third suggestion where Iqbal Nath Sarashara, a young poet, and Aran Bashir, a barrister, engage in discussions. And they say that a flush system of sewage disposal, that is a machine-based sewage disposal system, would save a lot of manual scavengers out of the shame. And when their occupation changes because of the machine, they will no longer remain outcasts. True, right? You, your occupation is what determines your caste as per the Chaturvarnya system. So the moment you become, uh, you don't need to do that manual scavenging work, you no longer become that particular caste. Or you, you needn't be discriminated. It's something that those two educated people discuss. And throughout these narratives, we could see that people who are educated, whether the Britishers or whether these uh, barrister or the poet or the liberals, they have this vision of equalitarians. But people who belong to the local culture, local folks, they tend to be minimalistic, they tend to be narrow-minded, they tend to be casteist and so on and so forth. So the plot is linear in form, simple in content, and he uses narrative techniques of stream of consciousness, flashback, reverie, interior monologue, etc. Stream of consciousness, you, may, you will all be familiar with the technique. Uh, a technique popularized by, name the two modernist British novelists who popularized this. It's okay even if you don't have MEG3. You have these two writers in MEG3, but it doesn't matter. The two British novelists who popularized the stream of consciousness technique. Think, 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 two modernist writers. One was a poetess, a herald of feminism, as well as she was into prose. The second person was a novelist who wrote autobiographical novels. He wanted to become a clergyman, then he abandoned that and chose writing. At least two novelists who are associated with... James, James Joyce, sir. Yes, James Joyce and... The Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf, spot on. So Virginia Woolf and James Joyce are two people who are associated with the stream of consciousness technique. Uh, if you haven't read them, 
I would suggest two novels each with Virginia Woolf, To the Lighthouse is a masterpiece. And uh, another novel that is a masterpiece, but not many people are aware of or read is The Waves, The Waves. And with James Joyce, both the works you may be familiar with, one is a portrait of the artist as a young man, and the second is Ulysses. If you want to read, read and get enlightened. Both these writers use stream of consciousness to a greater effect. Started by Dorothy Richardson, Virginia Woolf and James Joyce take stream of consciousness technique to another level. Here, Mulkraj Anand uses the same. What is stream of consciousness? Describing the thoughts of the character in the novel. Generally, we speak about dialogues, but then the thoughts of the character. In this case, Bakas conundrum, Bakas dilemma, Bakas humiliation, Bakas thoughts and his plight forms the part of stream of consciousness technique in the novel. Very briefly, I would also like to refer to another masterpiece writer of stream of consciousness. Uh, he is not a Britisher. He is thankfully a Malayali. Malayali people here would be able to connect to him. The best stream of consciousness novel, if you ask me, is from Malayalam. It is written by a popular novelist from Malayalam called M. T. Vasudevan Nayar. Can anybody remember the name of his stream of consciousness novel? In Malayalam, this technique is called Bodhadara. Bodhadara technique or Bodhadara novel. So a Bodhadara novel by M. T. Vasudevan Nayar. Apparently, it is the shortest novel written by M.T. Vasudevan. Generally, he writes thick novels. But then, there is a very thin, small novel that M.T. has written. You could read that novel from the concepts of existentialism, individual bereavement, a post-colonial, a post-war NUI, a fragmented identity. Quite a lot of concepts coming in that novel. The protagonist of that novel is Vimala, a school teacher. The name of the novel is Manya. It has also been translated to English by himself. The novel in English is titled The Mist. If you haven't read it, I would say it is a must read novel. The Mist. So in The Mist, M.T. Vasudevan Nair portrays Vimala's character using the stream of consciousness technique. Waiting is the theme of the novel, as in waiting for Godo, the eternal waiting that never succeeds, but we still wait. The beauty of waiting is glorified in that novel. He, she awaits her beloved who never turns up. So that's uh, the mist all about. Okay. I'd like to take a couple of minutes of break because my throat is turning dry. I need to drink some water. In the meanwhile, I would ask you to fill that sheet once again because uh, there are a few people who have filled it yesterday and the day before, but the WhatsApp group has not been initiated yet. So I have shared the link in the chat box. I'd give you two to three minutes to fill your details and somebody later take the initiative and start the WhatsApp group so that I can share these material links over there. I'll just take a couple of minutes break and come back and continue with the discussions on Gandhism because there is a Gandhian reference in Raja Rao's Kantapura as well. We'll quickly read through that and untouchable by uh, Mulkraj Anand. And there is one more thing I missed out while briefing untouchable. You should note that the novel is titled untouchable and not the untouchable. As a matter of fact, the novel is about Baka. So you, it is a single subject. So you could say it is about him and his plight, his story, and he is the untouchable there. So it could have been the untouchable. But the definite article is not used there because the writing, the writer generalizes the plight of Baka to all those outcasts who get humiliated in the same manner. So it's not about Baka alone. It also includes all the other outcasts who undergo the same humiliation. So that's why the novel is titled Untouchable and not The Untouchable. All right. And the video that I played right now is a popular song related to Gandhiji. But then this particular one is from Gandhi Got Say Ek Youth, the recent movie on Gandhi. Um, now, very quickly, 
let us get to a little bit of references of Gandhiji in Kantapura. Because it's already 7-3, I'm afraid we may not be able to touch any of the poems today. Not to worry, we'll get back to that tomorrow. Don't worry about it. I had thought of touching a poem or two here or there, but then we don't have time for that. So very quickly, because Kantapura will take another five minutes to 10 minutes for sure. So talking about Kantapura, it is a novel by Raja Rao. Kantapura is a novel where he tries to force, sorry, to focus on the freedom struggle, the Indian independence movement. One thing that is special about Raja Rao is he intertwines the myth and ritual heritage of India with the stories in order to describe the freedom struggle. A popular story that comes to my mind is, just in case you haven't read it, there is this amazing short story by um, Raja Rao called A Cow of the Barricades. Sometimes in school, it is also titled as Gauri the Cow or alternate titles. But nonetheless, that short story deals with the plight of Gauri, a cow, a rather inherently harmless creature in a village. And as a strife was building or a tension was building between the villagers who fought for Indian independence and the Britishers who were marching to the village with guns to threaten the villagers. Coincidentally, Gauri got in between. And metaphorically, Gauri became the warrior. And as Gauri was shot dead by the British sepoys, Gauri became a martyr for the cause of Indian independence. The way Raja Rao writes that short story, the, the way he unveils that story is really amazing. The patriotic, the patriotic flavor, the way, the flavor, the way he has instilled it, is commendable. On that note, coming to uh, Kandapura, set in a village, which is highly, you know, superstitious or a, a village of believers. I'll come to the plot sometime later this week because it it it, it requires an extended discussion. Currently, I'm only touching on the Gandhian presence. So a village which is extremely religious, they have this religious tradition of Harikatas. Harikata is more like a folk narration of uh, religious storytellings. The story of Rama, the story of Krishna, the story of Shiva and so forth in a seasonal way. Uh, so one, all of a sudden this patriotic favor takes center stage. Indian independence movement gather momentum and the people get around and the people in the village become huge fans of Gandhiji. There are people who have slight disagreements on certain things, but then they, they rally around Gandhian ideals and fight for Indian freedom. In order to do that, they look at Gandhi as, a, as an avatar of God and they sing praises of Gandhi. That's where that interesting element comes in. So that's how Raja Rao weaves a Gandhian village tale in Kantapur. One thing to be noted is, unlike Untouchable, Gandhi doesn't feature as a character in the novel. Gandhi doesn't come in the novel as a character. He doesn't deliver a speech. He is only a reported character who is part of the Indian freedom movement. He does not figure in the novel as a character at all. He is an invisible presence. And it is the wide impact of his thought which is felt throughout the book. The philosophy of Gandhian or the Gandhian ideals or Gandhian philosophy is introduced into the novel through a character, a central character whose name is Murti, who is the protagonist of the novel. Murti comes under the influence of Gandhiji at a very young age. He looks upon Gandhiji as a role model and follows him in every way, in word and deed. He preaches to the villagers the basic principles of Gandhian philosophy, such as Ahimsa and quest for truth. He persuades people to sew clothes, 
make kadi clothes and wear them the swadeshi clothes which are stitched by their own hands and to not use foreign clothes murti tells his followers in the village that spinning is as purifying as pray he creates the image of gandhi as a mahatma a great soul and a deeply religious man whom they admire and whose words they follow inspired by murti to the villagers gandhi is a mighty godly figure who emanates spiritual power that is going to overthrow the british rule in india just like we hear dash hai to munkin hai back then during the uh, freedom struggle uh, the saying was gandhi hai to munkin hai gandhi hai to azadi munkin hai that was the say so the villagers believe that the only person who can liberate the village uh, sorry the uh, who can liberate india is gandhi and uh, they saw him as a reincarnation of some god shiva vishnu or someone else he he uh, he had godly superpowers with him he could he could do anything so the people of kantapura and the adjoining areas are exhorted in the name of mahatma not to drink toddy or liquor in any form so this is seen in untouchable this is seen in kantapura as well murti invokes gandhian ideals and asks them not to drink liquor of any sort the toddy shops in the neighborhood are picketed to prevent sale of liquor non violent methods of course so gandhi's practice of singing bhajans at his prayer meetings as you saw in the video that i just played is generally appreciated by these people vaishnava janato is one of the famous songs among them the people take out their morning outings getting up at dawn gathering at the temple and going through the streets singing religious songs to that they start singing new songs in which gandhi's image appear as that of a king of humble origin the study material block 2 or rather unit 2 uh, gives us a lot of examples from that our king he was born on a wattle mat he is not the king of the velvet bed he is small and he is round and he is bright and he is sacred Oh Mahatma, you are our king, and we are your slaves. There's one, you know, invocation. And again, there is one government sister. There is one government sister, and that's the government of Mahatma. So similarly, there are quite a lot of hymns being sung by the villagers, who proudly declare that they are all for Gandhi. They are all Gandhi's men, and will do anything at his command. On several occasions in the novel. thundering slogans are raised to the skies like one day madram mahatma gandhi ki jai gandhi ji zindabad inqilab zindabad and so on they invest gandhi with superhuman powers but there is one thing about gandhi's teachings that people of kantapura do not understand at least some of them do not understand they wonder why he should advise the upper caste hindus to mingle with the lower caste parayas to live with them to eat with them and to intermarry with them why does gandhi say this gandhi being god why does he want to break the chaturvarnya system they find such behavior so unmahatma like especially some of them like batta and venkama we'll come to the story later and then you will get to know these characters more if you haven't read it so batta and venkama repeatedly belittle murti in the eyes of others because he associates with the parayas of the village when he tells range gauda one of his followers that gandhi wants to pluck people out of hatred from their hearts and love even their enemies gauda replies that's for mahatma and for you not for us poor folk we have already discussed that with untouchable people who are educated people who are enlightened like gandhi like murti or like the barrister in untouchable they all would be able to understand this ideal scenario of castlessness but common folk are still illiterate and they don't live in that idealistic universe and this is a concept that is too difficult for them to chew gandhi ji always advocated and he believed in simple living and all his life he tried to live the life of an ordinary man but then in kantapura 
an impressive image of Gandhi is projected, projected when he is sp spoken of in the same breath as some of the gods of the Hindu uh, lineage. There is this Harikatha teller in the in the novel called Jairamachar. So Jairamachar in the Harikatha man comes to Kartapura and tells a new kind of tale in which he mingles Hindu mythology with contemporary politics. He compares Gandhi to Lord Shiva when he says Shiva is three-eyed and Swaraj too is three-eyed. Self-purification, Hindu-Muslim unity and Khadar. Mohan being one of the names of Krishna, Gandhi's full name, Mohandas Karamchand, gives Jairamachar the idea of paralleling his achievement to that of Krishna. Just as the god Krishna, as a young boy, slays the serpent Kali, we are told that Gandhi goes from village to village, slaying the serpent of British rule. Again, just as Krishna teaches Arjuna the wisdom of how to be a true man of action, Gandhi teaches Murti how to be a true Satyagrahi. And because Gandhi interpreted self-rule as an ideal form of government in the manner of Ramarajya, the Gandhi myth is expressed deeply in Kandapur. So, this is a brief explanation of how Gandhian depictions abound in Kantapura. We'll come to the story of Kantapura sometime later, if we get time. If not this week, maybe when we get an extended session. We still have five sessions. So, Dr. Prema has promised that she will try to reschedule the remaining sessions if possible. So, if that happens, we'll come back to Kantapura and discuss the stories a little bit more later. And uh, with that, we somewhat come to the end of the day. We don't have time for a poem or two, or else I would have definitely loved to go through a poem because you have them for your annotations. And uh, as we draw close, we again have the floor open and we have almost 10 to 15 minutes for the Q&A. If you have any queries, any clarity required, any doubts or feedback, questions, anything, the floor is open. And I think I could see two hands raised. Sangeeta ji, I could see your hands are raised. Go on. Sangeeta Bose, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir, how is the concept of symbolic violence seen in Untouchable? You can see outright violence. How is symbolic violence seen in Untouchable? Uh, no, I was, I, was, uh, no I, was, I was referring to symbolic violence, not directly related to that. No. So I was referring to the concept of symbolic violence as a terminology. Because as students of literature, as people who would learn MEG5, literary criticism and theory, you may not come across several words because you don't get classes, because you are not regular learners. So there are certain terms which is good if you know them, because rather than speaking about the concept, you can use a term. So I refer to symbolic violence because when we speak about the literature, we speak about untouchability, we, when we speak about caste dynamics, and when we speak about its contemporary significance, let's say over a few centuries or over a few decades from 1940 onwards, caste system in India have undergone a lot of transformation. There was time like as, as represented in Untouchable, where a pariah could not progress further in a, in, a, in, a, in a society which is highly rooted in caste. But today, there could be a scenario where a, a sweeper's son would become a minister or a sweeper's son would become a businessman and would be known for his uh, job, his or her job that is. I don't want to be discriminatory, his or her job. Uh, but back then it was not the case. But even today, when we speak about laws being made and things being practiced and reservation being implemented and a lot of privileges being showered upon, even today, we would come across a lot of direct and indirect instances of caste discrimination and shaming and abuse. So symbolic violence is one such thing which is predominant today. That's why I gave you an example. This is something that I come across from various quarters of teachers or colleagues. I don't want to name them because the session is live and it's being recorded. And uh, apart from that, it, it is not uh, just 
to speak about people it it, 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 it ends up being a gossip so i don't want to do that but i can give you instances i know a college in cochin i'm speaking about cochin kerala the 100 percent literacy state progressive state so in cochin i know a college where in the staff room of department of english non-veg food is prohibited for lunch it is not prohibited by writing it is not prohibited by an order it's not prohibited by a uh, law but it is an unwritten rule that dominates that staff room so any new teacher new teacher would only be possible when a guest lecturer get up gets appointed otherwise uh, most of them are permanent faculty and they kind of have a, a camaraderie among themselves and they are probably belonging to the dominant castes and uh, they are okay with the vegetarian rule so when there is a guest faculty or someone who is in the reservation category who gets into that department uh, when they bring uh, non-veg food i know directly that these people are forbidden from doing it thereafter by various methods some people simply suggest like oh we don't eat non-veg here we can eat that in house now Oh, nyangal onnu yuvada vanna non-veg kari killa geto. Sandhi enda yuvada non-veg e chicken aga kondu erne. It is really harmful for health, you know. The cholesterol and sugar would increase, pressure would increase. So they use that, that sort of methods. Sometimes they also resort to abandonment. If these people, if this person is not listening and they are continuing by their choices, or sometimes if they are too dumb to understand these signs, then they slowly start ignoring that person. they start to uh, strand that person alone and maybe abuse them indirectly like they can't abuse someone on the basis of caste but they can tell them like you are not doing your work properly the students are complaining against you or this and that and that or give them more work pressure so these are ways in which symbolic violence functions this is just an example you could <laughs> you could find parallels to this in various other domains in that their own ways so there is no direct reference to caste there is no direct what you call calling up of caste names or no swearing at there is also a, a rather peaceful way of ignoring that person and avoiding that person which is though undemocratic like i told you if i am in a stage and i am not inviting a person who can equally be at the stage because of the caste dynamics that's a case of symbolic violence if you are with me and because you belong to another caste if i don't give you my face if i turn my back to you and do not give you face and do not speak to you that's a case of symbolic violence if don't come if I, if I, if i go with all of my other colleagues to have lunch outside or tea outside and i don't come with you for tea that is again a case of symbolic violence so i was not referring to it with the perspective of that no one but with the case of the day to day scenario I hope that is clear. All right. All right. Yes, Others, feel free to open up. Let me hear your voices. You know, this is one platform where anybody is going to come and say, "Speak and unleash yourself." Nobody is here to judge you. Nobody here is here to make fun of you. This is a. Uh, this is a. I agree. This is not as good as an offline classroom. but this is a platform which could facilitate you to come out of your shells and you can come out of your shells only by opening up you can never learn swimming without diving into the pool right good evening sir yes preeti ji go on yes so uh, today like i have attended your first lecture and it's uh, really amazing Thank and you. so as per you just mentioned that it's not as good as online class uh, sorry offline classes but for me Like these on online classes are a boon. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pradeep ji. That's so kind of you. I totally understand. So can I ask from M E G three? I mean, there is a um, murder in the cathedral. There is a reference for about. That's M E G two. M E G two. You are talking about murder in the cathedral is a play. Oh, sorry, sorry, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. So murder in the cathedral, and there are so many. uh references uh, regarding christianity like how to understand them so <laughs> you read the blogs it is described in the blogs pretty clearly or you may go google a little bit about ts eliot the poet workshop critic who has written that play and uh, you would realize that in the latter part of his life he had become an evangelist a missionary sort of a guy he he wanted to propagate christianity 
and uh, the play murder in the cathedral was written as part of the canterbury festival canterbury festival is a religious christian festival uh, and as part of canterbury festival theater festival was being organized and uh, t.s eliot uh, submitted his play murder in the cathedral to be performed there and that's why he opted the story of uh, the saint and uh, um, he he tried to glorify the death or the martyrdom of saint thomas abeket is that convincing enough ji priti ji so this to i understood earlier also uh, i mean there are so many references to like peter then uh, like so i'm unable to like yeah there uh, are there are there are quite a lot of biblical allusions being drawn and those biblical allusions are specific you know within two or three minutes i cannot sum it up for you but what you may do is you may look at megmentors.com i had shown that side in the in the first session so meg mentors i think have a lecture on murder in the cathedral which would sometimes be of help to you or read the pdf on murder in the cathedral in epg patshala if the study material block doesn't help you these two could sometimes solve your dilemmas probably if not wait for the meg two sessions if i happen to handle that session i will definitely get back into an elaborate discussion on murder in the cathedral don't worry or go figure out that youtube channel upload from rc coachin in that i would be detailing all these things in that link okay sir thank you thank you naseeba do you have a question i can see your hands are raised so the uh, fifth question of mg7 assignment is about mulkraja and untouchable so yeah. where i focus more to write the answer sorry uh, which point i focus more to write uh, the would you, would, you, would you mind reading that question for me because i don't have the pdf open right now okay mulkraj anand's novel portrays indian so- social problems realistically discuss with a reference to the novel untouchable it's a simple straightforward straightforward question isn't it indian social problems so back then what was the indian social problem among many others untouchability was a great menace so the novel as the title suggests deals with the social evil of untouchability and the need to get rid of untouchability okay thank you the central character who is a sweeper boy undergoes a lot of problems within a particular day a discrimination within a day and his plight seeks solutions and unlike as i told you other works on untouchability this novel tries to present three alternatives and just in case you want to add some spice and uniqueness to your answer as i told you most of them would be copying from the web or trying to copy from the study materials trying to write a summary of the novel so go read om prakash valmiki's jootar or bandhu madhav's poisoned bread or this entire anthology this is available in flipkart and amazon okay. so go read this and have a comparative analysis okay. then you can see how uh, indian social scenario is written by other writers as well okay. 